Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Well, we've had church already. Amen. What a powerful, powerful worship song. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew in that fifth chapter. And we're going to deal with the very last. Uh, it's actually the fifth one, but it's the last one in the series uh, on the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we're going to look this morning at verse number 7. And at the conclusion of the service, um, there will be the whole series available to you on Main Street at the media table. And uh, if you are interested in picking up one of those, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I always think uh, when we get through with the uh, 9 o'clock service, I, I think, boy, I wish the 11 o'clock could get in on this. Uh, and then when I get through with the 11 o'clock service, I think, wow, I wish the 9 o'clock service could have gotten in on that. And today is one of those times um, I'll be baptizing at 11 o'clock this morning a 90-year-old man who gave his heart and life to Jesus. Um, and... Uh, going to be an exciting, exciting time. I'm, I'm telling you, he's really thrilled. Uh, God's made such a difference in his life, uh, as God always does. And uh, his family was telling me that they're just seeing the fruits uh, of that experience already in his life. His, um, his taste in television programs, they said, we actually uh, come through and we find him watching uh, spiritual programs instead of uh, something else. And, and, that, and that's the way it ought to be, isn't it? Old things pass away and everything becomes uh, new. And I'm grateful for uh, his salvation. So some of you, by the way, he was scheduled to be baptized the Sunday that we had to stop services. And uh, so he's coming to, to get baptized uh, today. And maybe some of you uh, are here. You were scheduled to get baptized too. We can take care of that for you. And I hope that you'll uh, follow up with that real, real soon. One of our values at First Baptist, uh, if you know we got five of them, focused outreach. What's the B stand for? Biblical truth. And the C stands for Christ-centered worship. The I stands for what? Intentional care. And the T is for uh, transformed lives. And uh, one of the values we're going to be looking at this morning really is uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 7. And it is intentionally letting people know that we care, uh, that we have a walk with God and that we care about them. And uh, one of the things that you have heard from this pulpit for 37 years is we are all ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us are ministers. We don't just have a minister. We are ministers. And that word uh, actually can be translated uh, just as easily servants. So we're all ministers and we are all servants. And uh, we have a ministry in common. Every one of us uh, have uh, one ministry that really uh, we're all should be involved in. And that's the gift of mercy or the ministry of mercy. Every one of us in this room, all God's people really ought to be involved in the ministry of extending ministry, mercy throughout all of the world. Look with me, if you will, at uh, verse number seven. Blessed, what does that word mean? Come on now, this is the eighth. Surely by now you know what blessed me. Happy. Happy are the merciful, for they shall, what? Obtain mercy. They're, they're going to have mercy. If you give out mercy, then the Bible says that mercy is going to come back to you. Now, so it begs the question, uh, what is mercy? Uh, we can easily surmise that mercy is uh, forgiving people even when they don't deserve to be forgiven. Another uh, common definition uh, for mercy is helping people who 
cannot help themselves. So it's extending forgiveness to people that we think may not deserve it. And it is also helping people who can't help themselves. And that's just kind of the way that we have gone about serving God through this ministry of mercy. But let me just say this. It goes way beyond that. It extends way beyond those uh, two elements. It's kind of like a diamond. Uh, it's a multifaceted thing that God is requiring of us. And, and today, um, I, it's, it's like that diamond that has so many aspects about it, so many facets about it. I, I want to spend a few minutes this morning giving you seven facets uh, of mercy itself. But before I do that, uh, I want to ask you, why should I do it? Uh, why should I? And, and I'm, I'm going to give you four reasons why that you ought to be in the ministry of mercy. Uh, first of all, because God has extended mercy to us. Notice what the Word of God says in Ephesians 2. He says, but because of his great love for us, God who is, listen to this, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. So aren't you glad? I don't know about you, but thank God that he saved me when I didn't deserve to be saved. Thank God he extended mercy to me in such an undeserving person uh, like myself. I, I think about Matthew 18 uh, and that really that unforgiving employee of an employer. The employer comes along and uh, he says to the employee, now, I know that you owe a debt to me that you're never going to be able to pay. And, and Matthew 18 says that that employer says, you know what I'm going to do for you today? I'm just going to wipe the slate clean. Uh, I, I'm going to forgive you of everything that you owe me, and uh, we're just going to start all over. Well, that uh, ungrateful employee goes out, and he runs across an old boy that owes him some money. And he grabs him by the throat and about chokes him to death and says, I want you to pay me right now what you owe me. And he didn't and couldn't. And so... That employee had him thrown into prison. Well, the employer comes back and he says, wait a minute. Did, did I really just find out what I just found out about you? You mean to tell me that after all that I forgave you of, that you went out and treated this guy like that and didn't show him mercy? Here's what he said. Shouldn't you have shown mercy on him just as I showed mercy on you. That, that's the message of the Lord Jesus to us. Shouldn't we be in the mercy? Uh, shouldn't we be in the ministry of showing mercy to others that are around us simply because of what God has shown us mercy about? So, so he says, uh, I've extended. Let, let me give you the second reason you ought to be merciful. Uh, I, I, I tried to use uh, EX words. And so here, here's the next one. God exacts, E-X-A-C-T-S, God exacts mercy from us. What does that mean? It means that God has commanded us to be merciful. In Micah chapter 6, powerful, one of the most powerful uh, verses in all the Old Testament. In, in Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord, now listen to this question. What does the Lord require of you? And then he gives us three things that God requires. First of all, he says to act justly. Second, to love mercy. And third, to walk humbly with your God. So one third of the requirements that God places on our life is that you and I are to extend mercy to other people. So he exacts it. But by the way, I want to go a step further. And, and we just came through 
and, and are still involved in one of the most powerful worship experiences uh, when, man, we, we were able to focus in and zero in on praising God through music and through a song. And, and, and I'll be honest, it, it focused me in and glued me in into my relationship with him and my love for him. And I was able to lift my hands and to praise him. But, but do you know something? Listen to this statement. God doesn't care nearly as much about that as he does about us showing mercy. You say, how do you know that? One of the most powerful verses, I gave you one of the most powerful in the Old Testament. I'm gonna give you one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. And the reason that I know that is because Jesus quoted it two times in the New Testament in his relationship to the Pharisees. Now I want you to listen to what he said in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. He says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want you to be merciful. Hosea 6 verse 6. I would rather you be merciful than I had for you to come and sing your songs and praise me and sing Kumbaya and all of that. He says, I would much rather you be merciful than I had for you to keep the rules of rituals. Well, that's mind-boggling, isn't it? That's how much that God is commanding us to be merciful. Let me give you the third reason. Because the fact of the matter is we can expect to need more mercy down the road. The Bible says, you know, in, in verse 5, he, he says, blessed are, excuse me, verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. That, that, that's just saying you're going to need it down the road. You can expect to need it uh, down the road. James chapter 2 verse 13. Because judgment, oh boy, you hang on to your seats now. Did those seats have seat belts? Did we get them installed yet? <laughs> now I want you to listen to this. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, let me just say, one of these days that I woke up in the middle of the night last night and quoting 1 Corinthians, matter of fact, it was part of a dream that I was having in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in talking about the Bema or the Christian judgment, uh, if you will. And, and, and one of these days, you and I as God's children are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says, uh, you want to be able to stand at the judgment seat of Christ without fear? Then be a merciful person. But the fact of the matter is, if uh, you're not merciful to other people, you better watch out on judgment day because judgment is going to be without mercy to everybody who has not been merciful to others. Wow. Okay. Let me give you the fourth one because we got, we got to get into the meat. I'm just in the introduction right now. We, we got to get into the meat. The, the fourth reason that you ought to be, uh, to, to be merciful is because it exudes happiness. Mercy exudes happiness. N notice the first word in verse 7. Blessed, happy, joyful are the merciful for they shall obtain <laughs> Mercy. So a merciful person is just going to exude uh, happiness. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 21. It is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. So it begs the question, how in the world can I be a merciful person in such an unmerciful world in which I am living? Well, I'm glad you asked that question um, because some of these seven are going to be very recognizable. Some of these are going to be very familiar, but some of the characteristics and traits and facets of mercy, uh, you're going to hear, make you want to scratch your head just a little bit and say, wow, I never thought about that. All right, here we go. First one of the seven. Mercy requires patience. Mercy requires patience. Listen to the scriptures in Ephesians 4. Be completely. Now, that word completely means in everything. 
in all things, in all circumstances, in all situations. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. How many married folks in the building? Let me see you have. Do you remember why you fell in love with your mate to begin with? Do you remember the qualities that your partner had that attracted you to them? Huh? And you remember those things. And huh, the problem with most marriages is, is that somewhere along the way, we quit focusing in on all of those major characteristics and we start focusing in on the quirks. We start focusing in on all of the garbage. And we forget what we were attracted to them to start with. The Bible says here, you're bearing with one another. You're having patience uh, with one another. In other words, that's saying make allowance for uh, the other's thoughts. Hey, hey, sir, husband, I, I want you to know you married a sinner. She married a bigger one, but you married a sinner. I believe that patience is needed at home more than anywhere else where we live our life. Can I get an amen from anybody in the house? We, we, we need it at home. You, you understand, uh, there are two imperfect people that join together in the union. And when you have two imperfect people joining together in union, it's not going to produce a perfect marriage. It's, you know, I said this a, a couple of weeks ago. It's just two great forgivers that make it work. Amen? All right. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you have such patience in a home? Here's the answer. Wisdom. The wiser that you are and become, the more patient that you're going to be with the people that you live with, with the people that you work with, the people that you go to school with, the, the people that you, that, that you have uh, relationships with there, uh, maybe in your neighborhood. It, with, with every sphere of influence about you, the wiser you become, the more patient. Where does the wisdom come from? The wisdom comes from the Word of God. And so you spend time in the Word, you understand what the Word of God teaches, and the more patient then that you are. James chapter 3, the Bible says, The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. Listen to the last statement. Wisdom is full of mercy. All right, give me, let me give you number two. I gotta hurry. Man, time's flying. Mercy relieves people. I made a statement uh, a few weeks ago in another one of the, the messages is that uh, hurting people hurt people. Uh, and, and the problem is that you and I get so busy living our life, we fail to look around us and see the hurts that people are having to go through. And we, we just don't have the eyesight to do it. Uh, one time there was a guy who came to Jesus and he asked the question, said, uh, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus just responds real quickly. He says, uh, well, um, the first is that you've got to love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your life, everything about you. And the second's like it is that you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so the guy's trying to weasel out and he, he, he's trying to, you, you know, wiggle out of the situation. And he says, well, who's my neighbor? So Jesus goes on to tell the story about how an old boy was uh, traveling down the road to Jericho and he was robbed and he was beaten and he was left on the side of the road for dead. And somebody comes by and they don't even hardly look at him. A second guy comes by and he doesn't minister to him at all. A third guy who's a different race from a different culture, he picks him up, puts him on his donkey, takes care of some of the wounds that he could, and then takes him to a hotel in a nearby town and pays the bill and tells the guy, take care of this guy. And if it's more than what I'm giving you now, just, just trust me, I'll come back and pay you for whatever I owe you. Jesus looks back at the guy and said, now who's your neighbor? 
The guy said, well, <laughs> the guy who really took care of the man. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. Whenever you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Let, let me just quickly say this in conclusion of point two. You've you got to be on the lookout for hurting people. If you're going to be a merciful person, uh, you've got to be intentional. And, and one of the things that uh, the staff and I are working on so hard right now during this uh, very unusual time in our history is that we're looking at, at, from the perspective, looking at our community and saying, how can we make a difference? Uh, how can we let this community know that we're for them and that we love them? So you have to do it intentionally. Let me give you number three. You ready? Mercy releases the past. Mercy releases the past. You, you got to be able to forgive people. You got to give people a second chance, especially, especially, especially those that have hurt you. Um, you say that's not natural. I agree with you. It's not. The natural tendency when people hurt us is that we just want to get even. We want to strike back. Uh, we want to do tit for tat. Or, like mountain people, like me, you just want to write them off. I'm done with you. You know? That, that's the natural uh, tendency. But Ephesians 4, 31 says, and I want you to listen to this. A powerful statement. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. It's so important for us today. Why is that? Because it's the exact opposite of everything that we're watching being modeled before us in this world. It's the exact opposite of the way the world is treating uh, itself. Let, let me just ask you a question before I go any further in the message how would you rate yourself as far as being a merciful person so far? On a scale of one to 10, 10 being absolute, man, I'm, I'm right there. Where would you be on that scale? Let me give you number four. Mercy responds positively. Now, let me just give you the bottom line on mercy. That most people uh, would give you the definition for uh, mercy is giving people what they need instead of what they deserve. Why, why would you do it? Because that's exactly what God did for us. Can I get a witness about that? Hurting people, hurt people. Let, let me ask you this morning, just, just sit in your seat for just a second. Uh, when's the last time somebody really deeply hurt you? How recent has it been? When somebody just cut you to the bone, hurt you deeply, here's my statement to you. They need your mercy. They need massive amounts of love and mercy. Luke 6 says, love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything in return. You say, why should I do that? Well, for the very four reasons that I gave you in the introduction of this message. First of all, because mercy has been extended to me because I'm going to need some more mercy in the future and I can expect that and God has commanded me to be merciful and if I want to have a blessed and happy life, then I'm going to have to be that kind of person that Jesus has said that I need to be. Number six, excuse me, number five. Mercy reacts with a purpose. Mercy reacts with a purpose. I, I, I don't take any great uh, joy in what I'm about to say. But, but aren't you absolutely amazed and astounded at the increasing number of attacks that are directed toward the Christian community? Is it not flabbergasting to you to watch our culture and our society suddenly turn 
and start making Christian people the bad people of our day. Over and over, greater uh, acceleration than ever. Do you, do you know why? Do you know why this is coming to us? Because we're standing in the way of their agenda. The anti-Christian movement sees us as a barrier. And my response back to that is that we must obey God rather than man. This battle that we're facing is so offensive. But, I, but, but I'm, here's what I have to keep reminding myself. Me winning them to Jesus is a whole lot more important than me winning the argument. And I'm not, I'm not going to win them to Jesus if I respond back to them the same way that they are responding to me. First Timothy, I want you to listen to this. This is one of the most powerful verses. First Timothy, Paul writing, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, he, he killed Christians, he had them imprisoned, he was a major anti-Christ mover himself in his day. Now listen to what he said. I was shown mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. But for the, I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 1, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Wow. What are you saying? I'm saying we need to be really careful how we respond when we're offended by anybody. Because the fact of the matter is they've got to see Jesus in us because we received mercy from God. We've got to extend that mercy to other people. Let me give you number six. Mercy reaches out premeditatively. Now, that's a big word, isn't it? Premeditative. We, we usually equate premeditative murder, but today I want to talk to you about premeditative mercy. Um, it's intentionally developing relationship with other people with the sole purpose of winning those people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus had a relationship with a tax collector. Uh, now, some of you may work for the IRS and uh, be watching. Uh, you may work for the IRS. Uh, it, it's a lot different uh, back in Jesus' day than it is today. But this tax collector and that position was one of the most despised and hated and despicable positions that anybody could possibly hold. They were hated in their culture uh, and in their community. Well, this tax collector comes along and he invites Jesus and the disciples. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, and a bunch more notorious sinners to come to dinner at his house. Pharisees. Matthew 9 said, what in the world are you doing? Eating with sinners like that. That, that's despicable. How could you possibly uh, do that? Now, remember a few minutes ago, I told you that Hosea 6.6 6 was one of the most powerful uh, passages in, in, in all of the Bible because Jesus quoted it two times. He comes right on the scene and right on the heels of that with these Pharisees, and he just kind of says, let me tell you something, boys. Uh, I, I, I want you to understand that showing mercy is a whole lot more important than you going through the ritual of worship and paying sacrifices. You understand that mercy is building bridges with people that may not look like you, that may not think like you, that may not believe like you. 
in order that they can see Jesus in you and that you can win them to faith in Christ. That's being merciful. I'm talking about Republicans sitting down with Democrats. I'm talking about Democrats uh, sitting down with Republicans. We don't believe like one another, but that doesn't mean that we ought not to be loving and merciful in order to win them to Jesus. Now, let me just say something. The very minute that you start developing relationships with somebody that does not believe like you, look like you, think like you, and act like you, you're going to get criticized. I was in the company of uh, someone in the last two weeks, and I listened as they criticized uh, a, a family for having relationships with another family over here that are living an ungodly lifestyle. And they ought not to be, in fact, that, that's bad. That's, no, it's not. I was just thinking about Metrolina Christian Academy. And, and, and we're not here as a school to develop a socially elite class of people to isolate from the world. We're here to train up young men and women to know and to love Jesus so that they could penetrate the darkness and the lostness of our land. I thank God for the Christian teachers that are in the public school system. They have an opportunity to let their light so shine before men that they may see their good works and glorify their Father which is in heaven. If you know who you are and what your mission is, you don't need the approval of a bunch of self-righteous people that are going to criticize you. All right, let me give you number seven. I better get off of that. <laughs> Rules don't replace people. Rules don't replace people. Matthew chapter 12 Jesus and his disciples were walking through a cornfield and the disciples were starved to death and it happened to be on the Sabbath day. And all these rules and regulations concerning the Sabbath, the disciples pulled some corn off and they started eating and once again there was the Pharisees right in line to criticize and to find fault. Jesus said, wait a minute guys. Don't you even remember when David and his soldiers were coming through, starved to death, that they went into the temple and got the bread off, that, off of that sacred spot? He says, my men were hungry. What did he say? People are a whole lot more important than rules and regulations. Powerful word. And again, he quoted right there, Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. For that second time, confronting the Pharisees, he says, I am much more concerned that you show mercy than I do your sacrifices. Let me just challenge you here in closing. I want to give you all kind of a homework assignment. I want you to be risky this week. I want you to take some chances. I want you to start looking for some ways and some opportunities that God could use you to show mercy to other people. And if you're looking for it, God will show it. It may be with that person that has hurt you. Somebody that has sliced you to the bone. It may be with somebody that you work with or somebody that you go to school with, but I want you to begin looking right now for opportunities that God could use you to show that mercy. I want you to premeditate it. Somebody's already, many of you already right now in your seat, God has already through the power of the Holy Spirit enlightened you to some people that you need to premeditatively set up and go and show mercy to them. He's already shown you. You say, preacher, don't you think you're going just a little bit overboard with this thing of mercy? Yeah. You know why? Jesus went overboard showing mercy. When he went to Calvary and stretched himself out on an old rugged cross and shed his rich, red, royal, innocent blood to bestow on you a forgiveness that you didn't deserve. 
He went overboard. I, I've, I've got a philosophy that I live my life by. And I, I, there's probably hardly a month goes by that I don't quote this to somebody along the way. Uh, if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side of doing too much and not too little. When I get before God, I'd whole lot rather him say, well, that was overboard than I had for him to say, you fell short. So here we're going to go. We're going to be patient. We're going to let go of the past. We're going to find somebody that's hurting and we're going to show mercy to them. We're not going to get mad and offended. Well, we're not going to get mad and angry and retaliate when somebody does offend us. Remember, they need Jesus too. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Before, before you close your eyes, I want you to look up here just a minute. I, I, I'll never forget, I don't have time to develop all of this, but I, I will never forget when God extended his mercy to me. I, I, I just lived under shame. I lived under regret. I lived under dread. I lived under the threat every day of my life. I remember my lifestyle. I remember my language. I remember the deeds that were so filthy and ungodly before God. And I remember the day that he showed me his mercy and he forgave me of every bit of that. How many of you remember that day God showed you mercy? Huh? Isn't that wonderful? There's a ton of you that have never received his mercy. You know what? Before you can be merciful, you've got to receive it. God's got to give it to you. And could it be that the reason life is just doesn't have any joy and peace and contentment about it is because uh, you're not a merciful person? Because the Bible says if you want to be happy, if you want to have joy, be merciful. But before you can be merciful, you've you got to receive it from the Lord. And, and I just encourage any of you that are here right now, receive into your life God's mercy. Trust Him. Would you bow with me and let's pray together. Maybe that's you. Would you pray something like this right now and really mean it with all your heart? Heavenly Father, oh, I, I know that I'm undeserving of your forgiveness. I know that my sin has separated me from you. But Father, I'm asking you today to forgive me of all my sin. And right now, I receive your mercy. Right now, I receive your grace. Please forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. And save my soul. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me today. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.